Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Test Tubes and Cauldrons. First of all, I just want to thank everybody for all your wonderful, positive feedback on our first episode. Um, last week, it was really great to hear everybody's thoughts and the discussion that kind of came about from that. So thank you so much for that. This week, we are going to touch on a topic that is popular within the pagan and I think witchcraft community especially, but is also something that's pretty heavily debated, at least scientifically, and I think even in the psychology field. And even in witchcraft, the the way that we use it is also debated pretty heavily amongst different practitioners. But if you haven't guessed by now, this week we are going to be talking about shadow work, the history of shadow work, what it is, whether it can be even really thought of or analyzed scientifically, and then how people use it today, including our, our personal experiences. So without any further ado, let's get into our what happened on this day. And Hanny, I think it's your turn, so go for it. Okay, so today, as well as being Einstein's birthday, it was also the first day that the pioneering engineer Elsie Eaves was the first woman, she was the first woman to be elected to the American Society of Civil Engineers. As well as Elsie's work towards building gender equity in engineering, Elsie played a key role in revitalizing the American construction industry following the Great Depression. All right, awesome. So let's just pop right into it and we'll start with the first question we pose, which is what is shadow work? Like what actually is it? We hear this term all the time, but what what is it? What does it actually mean? Phil, I feel like you've got a giant stack of, of young books like sitting yeah. there. So, <laughs> and Man of the Symbols is like sitting right there for us. Yeah, I have Man of the Symbols or... literally right next to me. I think it's important to distinguish what shadow work was versus how it is viewed today. Because I think those are two completely different things at least in, in, in my humble opinion here. So here is how the shadow was defined by Jung. He defined it as the shadow cast by the unconscious mind of the individual contains the hidden, repressed, and unfavorable or nefarious aspects of the personality. But this darkness is not just the simple converse of the conscious ego, just as the ego contains unfavorable and destructive attitudes. So the shadow has good qualities, normal instincts and creative impulses. Ego and shadow indeed, although separate, are inextricably linked together in much the same way that thought and feeling are related to each other. That's from Man and His Symbols, uh, one of the, the works uh, written by Jung and other Jungians and analytical psychologists in the 1960s. So... Whenever I hear people talk about shadow work today, I rarely, if ever, hear people talk about ego, or which is a, a very psychoanalytical view of the the psyche. Now, I'm not super versed in in Freud or psychoanalysis, but the idea often is that there's like the id ego and super ego, which again, I'm not I'm not a Freudian, and that's not the point because Jung eventually split from Freud. However, he took some of those ideas like the ego and the shadow with him specifically the ego is more of like your conscious thinking whereas your shadow is your unconscious so therefore shadow is not necessarily bad it's just what lies underneath the consciousness i don't know if anyone has anything to add <laughs> yeah i was just gonna say like from a basic perspective my understanding was the shadow is the hidden repressed and unfavorable aspects of the personality and the idea is with shadow work is that you eventually integrate it into your ego. So you uncover those parts of your personality which are hidden, maybe that you're pushing away from you. And in um, uniting with your shadow, you become more whole, more kind of spiritually pure, some people would say. But yeah, what the shadow actually is, as you mentioned, is something a matter of debate. And it's maybe been a bit misappropriated by more modern interpretations. Right. And also... Um... Freud's, not Freud, woof, <laughs> young, young somewhere is crying <laughs> that I just called him Freud. <laughs> Freudian slip, I guess. So Jung viewed that shadow work primarily as taking place through dreams. So he specifically mentions in Man and His Symbols that the shadow appears in dreams as a personified form. However, he also believed that the shadow wasn't just personal, that it could be collective as well, which I think has some merit to it. Now there's studies today of inherited trauma, uh, which shadow is not always trauma, but, you know, we inherit some of the cultural aspects of uh, where we are raised. So it's also hard to talk about the shadow without talking about 
Jung's ideas of archetypes. So he called archetypes the tendency to form such representation of motif, representations that can vary a great deal. So he viewed archetypes as almost what he called like an objective psyche, part of his collective unconsciousness, this idea that humans have a collective symbology that looks very different from culture to culture, but is ultimately the same. Now, we're going to get into some critiques of that idea, but that is the basis, is that you have moon goddesses in, in various religions, you have sun gods and goddesses in various cultures and mythologies. This idea that there are certain aspects to mythology, specifically mythology, that is the same across cultures, according to Jung. And so he outlined this idea that archetypes are almost what we can internalize in some way. So there is a type of occult practice that is very, ba like the psych model of occult practice is pretty much based on archetypes. This idea of by calling forth the God, you are calling forth that aspect of the God in yourself, which is very much what Jung was a proponent of. And the shadow is not so much one archetype. If you look at archetype lists online, they often list like one is the ego and one is the shadow. But it's like basically polar opposites. He has this idea of the ego is one thing and the shadow is the other. As he said, they're inextricable from each other and there needs to be a blend of both. And that would primarily take place through psychoanalysis or analytical psychology. I love how he just called it the same thing, just separating the words out. I don't know why he did that. Mostly dream work, though, was primarily his sort of method for interpreting that. I think Zhang is really interesting in the way that he views kind of the idea of, of shadow work and archetypes because he takes on a very like psych model approach, but he tries to apply it a little more like scientifically or biologically. Like one of the ways I think he described his archetypes or his idea of the archetypes was biologically very similar to, I'm trying to remember the, where I read this, but it was like very similar to um, kind of inherited traits that are passed down from generation to generation. He uh, he kind of compared the archetypes to, to that phenomena. But I think, and this is a critique I'll, I'll expand upon later. I think it's, interesting that Jung himself applied a lot of this psych like this psychology and this this this, this psych model idea and tried to compare it with like a natural phenomena when I don't think the two are really compatible and I'll expand upon that a little later but I always found it very fascinating that there was such a discrepancy between the two yet he seemed he tried to bring them together collectively um quite often actually in his works yeah. So just to expand on the collective unconscious in a, in a way that's not just me rambling and put Jung in his own words, he describes it as just as the human body represents a whole museum of organs, each with a long evolutionary history behind it. So we should expect to find that in the mind is organized in a similar way. It can no more be a product without history than is the body in which it exists. By his history, I do not mean the fact that the mind builds itself up by conscious reference to the past through language and other cultural traditions. I am referring to the biological, prehistoric, and unconscious development of the mind and archaic man, whose psyche was still close to that of the animal. So Jung is basically saying that these archetypes that come from the collective unconscious, they're not coming from cultural development, which is kind of antithetical to what a lot of people might believe or, or what people might see as we will get into those critiques. But he is specifically saying that there is an evolutionary basis that dates back to like Neolithic times or even before in which uh, he, if you read Man and His Symbols, he consistently re says the phrase primitive man, primitive man, primitive man, and civilized man, which you can already see how that could get problematic. But in his idea, the collective unconsciousness came forth as the same time that our very idea of culture even started developing. Yeah. And the number of times I had to read phylogenetic, you would have thought I was in a lab. It was, <laughs> it was quite upsetting. <laughs> so, um, I think we'll get into the biology a little bit later, because that's a really good point you bring up. It is, that's the thing, it's projected as an objective collective reality, right? And actually where these kind of ideas came from were actually these kind of word association tests, which maybe were not so statistically rigorous. But either way, they're really powerful ideas, which have actually been influenced quite heavily by the occult community. And that's maybe why it's been so popular within kind of the witchcraft community. 
I also thought it was worth mentioning while we're on the topic of shadow work that it's kind of been applied in two senses. So Jung was kind of straddling the boundary of maybe science and the occult. And of course, his work went on to develop the kind of more modern field of psychoanalysis. However, shadow work has occult themes and is applied in a slightly different way. So we can see two paths for it in the sense of shadow work for mental health and shadow work for spiritual development. And I think it's really important to keep those two things separate because one of them is really maybe not so well evidenced and one of them is useful, but maybe let's not cross the streams too much when we're discussing those two themes. I, and this is a point that I did want to bring up this episode. Shadow work is is useful spiritually in a number of ways, and we'll get into this a little bit more later um, in our own personal stories. But like like Han, you mentioned, it should be separated from mental health and and dealing with any kind of mental health issues that somebody might might have. Shadow work is not a replacement for therapy, nor should it ever be, or any kind of medical assistance. And this is something that, in my personal opinion, like shouldn't be gone after alone. If you're going to do shadow work and want to utilize it in a mental health capacity, it should be done in combination with therapy with somebody who also has the skills to like help if something were to happen we hear a lot of horror stories sometimes of the things that have happened to people who have done shadow work by themselves and been unable to get out of certain ruts and so it's important to make that distinction and also like practice that distinction as well Um, please don't utilize shadow work as like mental health help (laughs) but moving on from that uh, we can go ahead and talk about the next topic which is where does the idea of shadow work come from so kind of give like a brief brief history i suppose Yeah, he was all over the map. I was researching his influences and I just was finding philosophies from everywhere. Um, One of the key ones was Plato. So Plato had this theory of ideal forms where you abstracted a concept from the physical world into a kind of a more, a timeless idea. So something isn't just its physical representation, but also its sort of mental representation, which enters, and you can see this idea of the collective unconsciousness. And that was also echoed by the philosopher Schopenhauer, who had this similar idea of everything having this collective unconscious striving and will. So he pulled from a lot from classical philosophy. He also pulled his idea of kind of light versus dark and shadow from the Greek philosopher Heraclitus. I think there might be some crossover with hermeticism there, although I think maybe you guys would be way more well informed on, on that. Yeah, there is actually. So it's really interesting because Jung was pretty heavily um, influenced by Hermeticism and the law of correspondence, which stems from the Hermetic saying of as above, so below, that you know everybody loves to quote that. <laughs> and Jung really admired the Hermetic philosophy so much because of its holistic view and inclusion of the psyche and the desire to see and understand the world empirically and kind of as, as an entire whole. He held a view that I echo myself really frequently and actually was the was the premise for this podcast, <laughs> for being totally realistic or totally truthful rather, which is that the psych, or even like if you expand upon that to magical processes, tend to be repressed in the interest of the scientific objectivity, when in reality, they play an equally important role as as physical reality. Um, and so a lot of Zheng's influence from hermetics stemmed from that idea of the law of correspondence. Um, he also pulled quite substantially from Eastern philosophies. So that included Taoism, this idea of internal alchemy, which kind of developed his idea of merging two aspects of the ego. Uh, well, sorry, the shadow, merging the shadow and the ego. He pulled from Kundalini Yoga, which to be honest with you, I don't know very much about, but I feel like it's worthy of mention. He even pulled from Gnosticism. So this idea that you develop spiritually by knowing yourself, illuminating within yourself and having this sort of inner unity. Um, obviously with shadow work, you don't necessarily have that same sense of um, y- a unity with divinity, but there are some quite common themes. So I think there it's fair to say that um, shadow work has significant crossover with the occult. I think it's also worth worth mentioning of his, he had many real world influences, but as someone who has read uh, Man and His Symbols, I think, and some of other Jung's work, I used to be like super into Jung, so I've, I've read quite a lot about him. It's important to note too, quite a number of times his sources are his own dreams. <laughs> He'll be like, this method came to me in a dream, or this archetype came to me in a dream. Now, I do a lot of dream work. Dreams have value. However, they should not be used as like empirical data uh, as to how something works. So that is another 
influence on, on Young is himself. <laughs> that is important to put out there. If I were to walk into a psychology conference today and, and say that this came to me in a dream, <laughs> I think I would be shown the door. So that's another important thing to keep in mind. Oh, well, we'll bring this up later, but I, I've seen some wacky published papers on dreams. <laughs> I was very surprised. <laughs> the field of psychology has some explaining to do. <laughs> Yeah, Hannah, you were very upset in our chat. It was, it was kind of funny. Okay, let's let's move on then and talk about kind of when when did shadow work become so popular in the occult and like witchcraft spaces? We actually did. We were super curious about this, and we went ahead and did a Google Trends search of, of Carl Jung and then also of shadow work, and it was really interesting. As you would expect, Carl Jung like was pretty consistent across you know the last like I think how far did we go back? looks like six-ish years. So it's pretty consistent, which makes sense because any kind of, you know, psychology student, I imagine at least is reference, reference to, to Carl Jung sometime in their studies. But it wasn't until March of about 2020, ironically, right, when we went into the pandemic, that the idea of shadow work really like took a huge peak in the Google Trends like search. And it's remained pretty high and it's still continuously rising. If you'd like do this search on Google Trends, it's very interesting. You should do it <laughs> just if you're curious. And I thought that was super, super interesting. And I wondered kind of what do you all, what do you all think about that? I think it, it, it makes a lot of sense that it's actually fairly recent, at least the term shadow work. Now, I think a lot of people conflate shadow work with reflection, which I will get into probably right. when we get more into the criticisms of it. But I literally had never, ever heard the term shadow work. Well, I had heard the term shadow work before because I read young, but I'd never heard it tied to the occult community until this year. Now, I took a, a substantial break from the occult community pretty much between like 2015, 2016 to about 2020. And so I literally just, I remember entering all these discords and everyone was like, do some shadow work, shadow work this. And I was like, what? What? Why are we suddenly talking about young? I'm so confused. <laughs> so it's like really, and, and I see a lot of new practitioners come in and immediately start talking about shadow work. And, and it's sort of, people think that it's been here for a while, but it really hasn't. <laughs> now, young is extremely popular in the occult. So one could argue that the idea of the shadow and the ego and young in general and archetypes have been a part of the occult community since it's pretty much resurgent. So I... In my notes here, I have written down the book Drawing Down the Moon by Margot Adler, which is a sociological study on specifically neo-paganism and witches and, and other occult practitioners in North America. And it's really funny reading all of her interviews with all of the practitioners at that time. And this is like largely the 1970s. And then later on, she did a revised edition in the 90s. But it's still pretty much the same. If you look through them so many times, it's just like young, young, young. And they like talk about archetypes and they talk about the ego. So it has a, a very long history in the rebirth of the occult, whether it was conscious or subconscious. Not to, I don't mean that to be a pun. I mean that to be literal. <laughs> so Jung himself has had a huge influence on our community. Most people don't realize that necessarily. However, it is new that people have been divorcing shadow work from Young. And when I see people recommend shadow work, they're like, read Young, but that's that like Young writes so much stuff that would be like if I recommended someone to just like read Sophocles. <laughs> I'm just like, what? He's written... <laughs> There's so many plays there. <laughs> what do you mean just read this? Yeah, people people don't direct them to the specific area in which which Young talks about shadow work or even kind of in a even without using the term, like the idea, when people say, you know, read Jung, it's like, okay, well, we'll read what? Like, there's so many different things that he touches upon. Right. And I, I personally, for one, am, am against people just sort of picking up Jung for ideas for therapy or like self care or reflection. I love reading Jung and his contemporaries because I think it's interesting. And I think the idea of archetypes is fascinating. I have a lot of critiques of it, but I think it's interesting. However, I never once entered like reading Young or The Hero with a Thousand Faces by Campbell. I never picked them up with like, ah, oh, these people are going to tell me how to better myself. They're not self-help books. <laughs> They're like dense theory, essentially. Yeah, I think, um, first of all, I'm very proud of us for making a graph 
for this episode. I think that's <laughs> really emblematic of <laughs> the spirit of this podcast. Um, but yeah, I think it's no coincidence that it's March 2020 where we started seeing the increase in shadow work interest because it's really just used as a, a band-aid like for therapy. And it's I can see why people would think that because it, um, shadow work and the, those concepts were so instrumental in the development of psychoanalysis but they're not the same. And I think maybe that's, yeah, it's this kind of idea of self-care that has been tied into it. It's become a lot more popular as, ironically, our collective unconsciousness has become a lot more anxious. So a lot of people are seeking out ways that they can make, them, make themselves feel better. I do think that self-care and shadow work have definitely been tied together because a lot of times in like, especially the witchcraft like discords that I'm a part of, um, I'll oftentimes see people say, you know, shadow work can be really intense. Like make sure that you take care of yourself after you do shadow work, which I think in and of itself is a slight issue because I don't think you should be doing shadow work that like ends up making you cry on the floor, like unable to 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 function. I think that's that's the wrong utilization of this tool. But yeah, they, they are they are tied together quite closely a lot from what I've seen. And I don't necessarily think that's a that's a good thing. Let's pop over to some of our critiques. Let's talk about why Zhang has fallen out of favor in modern psychology. Is and is there any science that actually supports Jung's idea of archetypes or also the idea of shadow work? So let's kind of let's pop topics there and we can just back and forth it. So I had a look, and obviously only had a couple, like a week to prepare, so I was kind of limited in the amount of research I did. But I did really struggle to find explicit references in quantitative studies to shadow work. So if you look at Jung's original work, so not talking about his archetype theory, it's not talking about his you know dream stuff, talking about his actual scientific studies. It was really just kind of word association studies and seeing how people responded in groups or how long it took somebody to respond to certain words and then building those words into certain archetypes and saying, okay, well, this one this one is important because these, these people reacted more than this group of words. And there was no statistical analysis involved whatsoever. It was literally just kind of an observational pattern between diff- different word groups, which really is not very robust. So then if we look um, later into how shadow work might have been applied, I couldn't really find very, very many objective studies into how it's been applied in a therapeutic context. However, as we've mentioned before, it was quite instrumental in developing the field of psychoanalysis. And psychoanalysis is very controversial in psychological fields. So I found three meta-analyses one of which found um, quite a strong evidence base for a treatment in borderline personality disorder, but nothing in loads of other conditions. So OCD, bulimia, PTSD, psychosis, it works slightly for some depression and anxiety disorders. And there was, throughout these three meta-analyses, it pointed towards really, really bad, badly controlled trials, considerable heterogeneity, so lots and lots of variability, making the trials really, really hard to compare. They were analysing things like 600 trials and then only 14 of the trials actually made the criteria for analysis that's just, that's an idea of how bad the actual research base is i don't think it's fair to say that young's work scientifically speaking empirically has had a really beneficial effect for people with mental health issues for spiritual development obviously that's a bit harder to measure yeah another another thing too to keep in mind with, with just like i mean you mentioned psychoanalysis and it's sort of controversy and the mental health field. I mentioned Young to my therapist and the look on her face. It made the look on her face. It just made me laugh. So a lot of times, and this was brought up by someone in one of the Discord servers that we're a part of, was that sometimes psychoanalysis is still applied in when you're looking at like anthropology or like if you're in film criticism. I've taken film classes before and a lot of times a lot of the stuff you're looking at is using a a Jungian or psychoanalytic and Freudian approach. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I still have issues with their like basis of archetypes. But generally, generally, and this is not true everywhere, you don't see people who are very out loud like I am a psychoanalysis or I'm an analytical psychologist, Jungian psychologist, and there's a reason for that. (laughs) Jung and Freud's primary treatment for what they saw as integration of the shadow and what actual shadow work was, was dream work. And there's been very like kind of weird hit or miss uh, studies on dream work. And I, I believe Henny has one linked here. I don't know if she wants to talk about that. But yeah, so a lot of what people don't realize is that shadow work was never like 
it was never like you journaled these the young gave you these journals and or prompts and you wrote them down it was pretty much let's talk about like this dream you had or you would have a dream and then that would clue you into what your shadow is so it wasn't like straight Freudian dream interpretation but it was heavily tied to the subconscious and how that could be accessed either through dream analysis or through other types of like art therapy which does have its merits but like it would be like word association and so things that tapped into your subconscious specifically so Henny, I don't know if you want to talk about dream analysis because I know you, you found yeah, some. Yeah, I was just I was just pulling up the paper just now. Um, yeah, I, I was actually quite shocked. I was shocked when I was trying. I was reading papers from psychoanalysts because they are out there. I've actually had an experience with the young game psychologist myself, but they, that psychoanalysis is it's declining, but it's alive and well. And there are actually psychologists who use dream work in their work with patients. Um, and I couldn't believe it because often in psychoanalysis, you have this also this concept of transference between your yourself and your patient. And I won't go into kind of the ethical quandary between that. But I think the the idea in this study I was reading was um, the psychologist would have a dream about their patient. And the paper was suggesting that in most of the cases, this dream was diagnostic. And I just want you to ask yourself, would you trust... Your, if your psychologist turned up to a therapy session and said, I had a dream about you having sex with me and I'm, I'm because this is what this was saying. In the, there were examples in the paper of aggressive behavior from the psychologist towards the patient or in reverse. There were examples of the patient holding the psychologist like a baby, just no evidence for it in a psychologist setting or very, very poor evidence. And honestly quite unethical in my opinion so I, I don't have a very high opinion of dream work in this scheme I think it's it's very valid personally speaking but not from a therapeutic perspective I wish you guys could see my face right now because I'm just like what <laughs> I just watched you react in real time to that <laughs> that was very funny um I think it's also important to note that what shadow work originally was Young's outline for shadow work and how to do it which is not seem to be how people refer to it now shadow work could not be done on your own it was not possible <laughs> that was not the point of shadow work was that you went to a psychoanalyst or an analytical psychologist or like just a, a Jungian psychologist in general and then they would help you through the shadow shadow work was never something young advised to do on your own and it was never something that was built as a practice to be done as your own in its very raw form of course it has been warped and we'll talk about what shadow work seems to look like today which is hard because it's rapidly evolving but shadow work at its core was never ever meant to be done alone it was always meant to be done with a psychoanalyst or an analytical psychologist Phil, i have a question for you um what do you what do you think then caused the shift in the understanding that it was it wasn't meant to be done alone versus now the fact that it is almost encouraged to be done alone to to better yourself or integrate your own shadow honestly it blows my mind because i'm just like i said i came into i came back into the occult community and i was like why are we talking about young <laughs> like what is happening i honestly i th i think and some people have now this is all conjecture and there is no like evidence I have for this because like I said rapidly evolving. Some people have said that it's partly because like ooh shadow work sounds ooh cool and then it's just sort of snowballed or people who were like armchair youngians uh, took this and tried to blend these ideas. I will say like I, I have read uh, Man and His Symbols and there are some really interesting ideas that you can apply to your occult practice. We were saying he he drew from a lot of, he drew from like hermeticism specifically. So there were occult influences, but it, it's strange to me that people are now kind of instead of applying it to an occult perspective, which I think is a lot less weird <laughs> than applying it to a very like psychological effect. I think a few people brought up shadow work and then suddenly it's everywhere the amount of times i open youtube and youtube recommends me like 20 shadow work prompts and i'm like i don't want this shadow work prompts for the yeah and i'm mood. like i don't <laughs> want this stop showing me this so i don't it really snowballed i think i think one person might have had a grasp kind of on it and was like oh you can shadow work on yourself but then it snowballed and spiraled into something that it was never actually yeah so the, the lots of a long way of me saying i have no idea and i would also like some answers <laughs> 
I think it's the name. I do think it's the name. It's the spooky shadow work that makes it sound very mysterious and marketable. I don't know. It's my gotta make it sound witchy. It's gotta sound, it's gotta fit the aesthetic. I think that part of it came from people reading Young's works and not understanding, like not looking at it from the proper point of view. I think that's also a big issue. And it's an issue we see a lot of times in the scientific community where people who aren't scientists and don't have the background for it coming in and interpreting scientific data and doing so incorrectly and then leading to misinformation. I think a lot of the same thing is happening with Young as you have people from the occult coming in reading his works and not interpreting it in the way it was meant to, which you might have been taught in like a psychology class. And so then misusing that misinterpretation and then going to form like an entirely new thing that we call shadow work now. Um, I think that is is kind of a big reason why it got so misconstrued. But that's, I don't know if that's true or not, but it's just a thought that right. I have. I, and like, I actually would have less of a problem if people were taking Jungian archetypes and theories and applying them to the occult, because a lot of them are. <laughs> so there are ideas that we can see echoes in the occult community And I honestly, if you want to take his archetype of the old wise woman and the trickster and put them into your occult practice, sure. But I don't think that should be applied to your very real brain. (laughs) I don't think it should be applied in a therapeutic setting ever. (laughs) Now, I, I have very strong opinions on that very clearly. So, you know, there's room for debate there, I guess. But I honestly don't mind people putting Young in an occult community. It's just weird when... People like take Young out of his context, shove him in the occult, and then remove that and then put it onto self therapy. And it's just like this really weird web that doesn't make sense. I think my primary issue is that there are all these spiritual philosophies that we've alluded to, which have to do with kind of this idea of inner unity. And lots of those are really valid and are really useful for people. But people maybe go to Jung because they feel like there's some kind of scientific backing and they feel like it's more sort of psychology, it's more mental health. And actually it's maybe not very safe in that in that setting. So I would much rather people were approaching it from an occult perspective because at least then you know what you're getting. Um, you're not using this pseudo-scientific veneer to try and justify it. And I guess just to, because we have quite a few critiques here, just to to get into some of them. As I mentioned, like Jung, Jung's work and a lot of like Freudian work and a lot of work just like of early psychology of the 20th century. And this is evident too in early occult practices of the 20th century is this gender essentialism. There's a heavy, heavy emphasis on biological sex, which you can see how that could get real problematic real fast there's a quote from young in here yeah he said in dreams and myths therefore the shadow appears as a person of the same sex as that of the dreamer and then he also says although we do see the shadow in a person of the opposite sex we are usually much less annoyed by it and can easily pardon it yeah for some reason he thinks that if i see someone who is of my same biological sex and they do something and it pisses me off that it's like something that's a fault within me Whereas if I see someone who is, in his eyes, quote, the opposite sex, and they do something, I'm more likely to excuse it, which I'm like, okay, am I though? (laughs) And then also this idea of it it always appears as a person of the same sex in the dream. And and another thing, too, is that he has specifically Western Eurocentrism. So here's a fun quote from Man and His Symbols. What the West has tolerated, but secretly and with a slight sense of shame, comes back into the open and in full measure from the East and ties us up in neurotic knots. It is the face of his own evil shadow that grins at Western man from the other side of the Iron Curtain. Whoa. (laughs) The audacity of this man who stole so much from Eastern philosophy to then, he he stole it, he misunderstood it. There's a really good blog post I can link to say that. He, you know, he misunderstood a lot of this philosophy, although he did apply some of it effectively. And then reflect it back and say that they're neurotic. Young, what are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> uh, additionally, Young's archetypes are inherently tied to his own view of primitive versus civilized. And many make the arguments that him and his contemporaries divorced myths and mythic figures from their culture and context in an attempt to shoehorn them into so-called universal archetypes. Yeah, there are man and his symbols. There are some wildly problematic things in here, which he went to indigenous cultures of South America and North America, and he just took pictures of what was going on and then analyzed them from this very Western Eurocentric perspective. 
and then just attempted to shoehorn them into his collective unconscious and was like, this is why they do this. And I'm like, is it young? Are you sure? How do you know? Yeah, one of the issues with like the idea of the archetypes is that even though they're supposed to be universally applied, they aren't universal. And there's not a lot of evidence to show that they are universal. And in fact, there are a lot of instances where if they truly were, were universal and everybody should experience these archetypes, you would expect everyone to be able to like activate them or have some kind of experience related to them. But there are people who simply can't. They, they can't activate a particular archetype or, or even recognize it, which begs the question then, are they truly universal? Because the fact that we have so little evidence to suggest that they are makes me think that they probably aren't universal and that there's something else going on. And we'll touch upon that a little bit later, kind of what maybe another explanation for that might be. But I, that's a big issue that I take with, with the idea of Jungian archetypes is that we have little to no evidence that they're actually universal. Right. Yeah, because if you divorce something enough from its culture and context, with things that are subjective like symbology, you can really say whatever you want. And if you talk long enough <laughs> and have enough pages, people will be like, yeah, okay, that makes sense. We even joked in my house that we're going to have once, you know, get togethers are a thing again. I would like we're gonna have like a an act like an art professor day in which we just like put little tabs underneath all the really random photos that are in this house and then have people like analyze it from <laughs> uh, in depth theoretical perspective. Basically, yeah, you can talk about anything and have it make sense if it is subjective. I'd say that's true. Yeah, I mean something that's like super personalized, right? If if you talk long enough, that that personalized opinion or, or view of something can become quote unquote logical, if you will. And sometimes to the extent enough that it's actually taken as, as more of a theory or a fact rather than just an opinion. Right. Which is the whole problem with archetypes. On that note, do you want to talk about Myers-Briggs? Because that actually comes heavily from Jung. And I think maybe we can draw some parallels here between what's useful and what's statistically validated. What do you guys think about Myers-Briggs? <laughs> I used to be so obsessed with it so obsessed with it like so like it got to the point that i would just like be analyzing everyone around me be like what what are they in the mbti however i definitely do recognize that there are massive problems with it some people like to joke that it's the pop astrology of the psych world <laughs> which i don't think is necessarily wrong yeah, I used to be really into Myers-Briggs and I blame part of it for like back in high school and stuff when they made you take the Myers-Briggs to like help you understand yourself better and whatever. But it never really worked for me. Like my my type, I think I'm, what even am I? I think I'm an ESTJ or something like that. But there are definitely portions of that. But if I like read the description, I'm like, um, not really. Like that doesn't really fit kind of my view of who I am. And if you ask my friends, they'd be like, sensing? What are you talking about? So yeah, I definitely think that it's it's outdated and some of the the things people use it for, I think, or it's it's overused in terms of helping people try and like understand themselves. It might give you, yeah, like a very basic overview that might have some relevance to to how you feel like as a person and the way that you um, present yourself to the world, but I really don't think it's very accurate at all. Definitely wouldn't be basing your entire personality on your Myers Briggs type. I think we're in agreement here because um, <laughs> I, I brought this up because um, the actual typing system was really, really heavily influenced by Jung. And I think we can draw parallels between the personality types that he saw and the archetypes he, he also developed or this idea of archetypes and how he's tried to massively generalize in both cases, but maybe hasn't succeeded. And while archetypes are a little bit more fuzzy, so we can't define them and test them as easily, um, the Myers-Briggs personality type tests we can at least check for test to retest variability so okay if some does somebody consistently come up as the same personality type and the answer is lots of studies found out that they don't and or if they do find that um, that they do retest well then usually those studies are conducted in really different ways so we can't trust them and i think that's a really good sign that scientifically speaking this idea of archetypes is maybe not very robust that doesn't mean it can't be useful to you but in a broader population level maybe not super robust. Well, even like my own personal experience, my 
Myers-Briggs has changed three times when I'm only what, 25 years old. Like I'm not even that old. It's already changed three times. And I think a lot of that has to do. And so because of that, it does throw doubt on the idea of like this, the universal archetypes, because theoretically it should remain the same throughout your entire life. So if it's changing, that suggests that maybe archetypes are based more upon cultural and societal influence rather than this like universal um, idea. Yeah, I think it's really interesting that the occult community hasn't latched onto like any of his other ideas. I'm not saying they should. But yeah, no, I think it's very funny that out of everything, everything that Young has written, like it's funny because like I literally didn't even remember what shadow work was. I have read so much archetypal theory and Young that I like was like, wait, shadow work. And then I was like, oh, Young? <laughs> what? Out of everything that Young has written, it's just very funny that the shadow work is what people have really glommed onto specifically i mean i think it makes sense especially if you see the spike in march 2020 but i just think that's very funny that i think there are other actually useful well use could be potential to be useful ideas but it's so we've just taken like shadow work and divorced it from everything else I kind of think one of the reasons why it might have taken such a gain such popularity is because of this idea of like a generational psychic experience and the manifestation of trauma like being being passed down essentially um, with each with each generation. Because when you hear people talk about like working with their ancestors, this is something that I hear sometimes from I would say more new age practitioners than they do from like from like occult practitioners. This idea of like oh, this trauma is being passed down from like generation to generation psychologically. And I know Young like talks about that in some of his works. And so people, he gets reference for that. And then people go and they discover shadow work and it like kind of spirals from there. <laughs> I know, Felicity, you have some thoughts on the whole idea of like a transfer of trauma from generation to generation, like psychologically. What are your thoughts on that? I mean, here's the thing. I don't have, I don't have any fully formed evidence-based opinions. However, I will say, and I don't necessarily, and like there, there is, from what I have seen, there are varying studies that have attempted to answer like can trauma, et cetera, be like passed down through genes, essentially. I'm not sure about that. So for example, in my own family, I come from a fairly long line of Puritans. And I know this because Puritans loved record keeping. So I don't think necessarily there's something that is connecting me to like, someone who lived in Salem 400 years ago other than DNA however the family culture that is passed down I think that is something that can like I inherit so I don't think it's necessarily like I literally inherited the trauma of my ancestors or the trauma of my grandmother for example but I do think that there is a sense of family culture that is just very much interwoven together. Like if I, if my grandmother has a proclivity towards mental illness, I likely do as well, just because of, there, there is evidence to suggest that. But I think, you know, family culture is extremely strong, which is more where the idea of inheriting trauma comes from, if that makes any sense. I agree that it's mostly um, based on culture and also things like systemic factors like poverty and also racism. There is this idea that epigenetics can affect trauma passed down from generation. That's very controversial. I don't know if Astra, you want to touch on that and its critiques or? I take real issue with the attempts to to place the psychological transfer of trauma from, from different generations and compare it to epigenetics. And part of that is because trauma I don't think that it inherently changes one's gene structures. I don't think we have evidence of that. Granted, I haven't looked super intensely into into this particular topic um, regarding like epigenetics. But while stressors can influence us as humans and make some changes in like our DNA and how we function and like our cells, stress response and all of these kind of things, I don't think it inherently alters our DNA, which is how that information is transferred from generation to generation. And so because of that, I really take issue with that comparison because I don't think you can actually compare them. I don't think the two are substantially similar in that way. And so comparing them leads to a misrepresentation of what exactly this like generational trauma is which I think is more cultural and societal like Fel mentioned rather than epic like rather than genetic I really think it has nothing to do with genetics at all 
aside from like mental illness, that's different because mental illness, like there, there is a connection there to, to like science. And we know that there are particular like genes um, that if are, you know, more expressed or certain receptors that you have, you know, a higher concentration of, it can lead to certain mental disorders. Like that is, that is scientifically accurate. It's been scientifically studied. Like we have data for that. That's different. But like generational trauma, I think is a completely separate thing. And I definitely think it's more cultural and it's much more societal than it is than it has anything to do with genetics. I would love to look into it more to see if maybe I'm wrong here, but um, based on my knowledge of genetics, I really don't think it's, don't think that's how that works. Yeah, I also, um, I looked into it briefly. I should point out as well, when we talk about epigenetics, we are talking about, so not inheritance through the actual normal sequence of the DNA, so that's like more Darwinian genetics. We're talking about a more, I guess it's like Lamarckian style, where you have modifications to the DNA, so methylation, which is added to the sequence and that affects how the DNA is expressed. It's not like your, your genes are changed, but the way they are read and translated changed, which is a, a subtle difference. Um, and the thing is that these epigenetic modifications are quite rare. Um, they're not, they don't happen very often. There is evidence that epigenetic changes over generations can happen from things like smoking, um, things like prisoners of war, the um, children of prisoners of war, might have more epigenetic modifications. But then there's an argument that that's also related to poverty, lifestyle. It's really, really hard to extricate these factors. And so the only real data that we have that is is not so confounded is from mouse models, where they um, basically they made these poor mice feel pain and they gave them the scent of a cherry blossom when they experienced pain. And then their children of these mice who are not exposed to their forefathers were exposed to the scent and they supposedly experienced more sensitivity to the, to the smell because they, in theory, inherited the memory of the pain. But small sample sizes, you're relying on mouse behaviour. It's just maybe there's something of to come of the field, but so far I don't think the evidence is very robust. I, I would be really keen to see it develop further. In, in relation to the animal studies, I work with mice and rats for a summer in an internship and behavioral studies with animals, it is really hard to definitively say one way or another whether a behavior you're seeing is due to the variable that you're studying or if it's due to something else. Because even though we we can get kind of a baseline for the animals, they vary from, from animal to animal themselves. And so even the offspring will act very differently from the parents and so those kind of studies where you're it's even something like like the smell I mean there's there's so many things that I that you know you can't control for there and I think that's we would definitely need more data more concrete data to, to say one way or another yeah for sure yeah I also there's a lot of other biological essentialism which he, he explicitly young explicitly mentioned I, I think Fell alluded to it earlier but he explicitly mentioned that the subcortical system being the basis of archetypes. I would conjecture that such a subcortical system might somehow reflect characteristic of the archetypal form of the unconscious. May I point out, he has no evidence here. Didn't touch a brain. Young, never touched a brain. (laughs) As far as I know, no formal education in neuroscience, that this idea of it being somehow entrenched in our biology has been passed on. Some neuroscientists have discussed it. I found papers suggesting that, but I again, didn't really find anything robust, didn't find anything replicable. So I think this is definitely more of a cultural thing, at least from my point of view. So now now that we've thoroughly let Young roast himself on his own words, while we stand listed there and talked about it, do we want to talk about the potential uses of shadow work and what it could, I guess, or if we think it can be used at all, et cetera. Yeah, Annie, you said you had an experience with a Jungian psychologist, right? So you wanna do you wanna talk about that? It wasn't good. <laughs> so, <laughs> um that's pretty much my experience. I think I only worked with them for a really short amount of time and it was when I was a bit younger. So just transferring into adult services from so I think probably 17, 18. And your your personality is still developing at that time. I was going through like a lot of changes in my life because I was moving out of my house and I was, it was, what was going on with me at the time was really more to do with my environment and the stresses in my environment and the kind of trauma of that. But instead, I was finding that I was being boxed in by this therapist who just really wanted me to 
subscribe to this particular idea of a particular archetype and then when I resisted that it was like that was a sign of my of my failure as a patient like like I wasn't I wasn't willing to confront my shadow and it's kind of a confirmation bias thing right because then if I'm unwilling to confront it it's like oh well it's uh, it's repressed it must be the shadow so I think there are definitely really bad practitioners out there and for that reason I haven't had a good time with it in the psychological realm and I might even go as far as to say that it shouldn't be used there without other techniques which are better validated. That there is a, a workshop that's run by a clinical psychologist, so anyone's interested, that works with the idea of myth and fairy tales. If, if that's something that you find useful, but it's not for me. Yeah, I I think the utilization of, of Jung's idea of archetypes in the clinic, I think it's problematic precisely for the reason that you, you mentioned, Hanny, which is that it tries to fit people into a box when people aren't meant to fit into a box. And we aren't we aren't meant to fit into a particular set of specifications. And that's just that's not how people work in general. And I think trying trying to force that is is very detrimental in regards to like mental health and trying to understand kind of what's going on there. I never worked with a Jungian psychologist, thank God, based on your experience. But I did at the beginning of my craft, I had heard of shadow work through kind of a bunch of back channels, which was which was odd at the time. And I did do like a couple of sessions like by myself and nothing good came from it. It definitely resulted in some like very emotional, not super great moments that I don't like ever wants to do again and that's definitely why I recommend that like new practitioners really like please don't do it by yourself it's not meant to be done by yourself it's really meant to be done in combination with like therapy if you're going to do it at all but even then I, re- I remember when I talked to my therapist about um young and psychology and I asked you know like what do you think we had a really interesting conversation about how it's like super super outdated um and there are better techniques to be used and so I think kind of like we've said this whole episode it's useful in the occult sphere but not as shadow work as it's useful in terms of the idea of archetypes certainly i think we see that a lot more consistently the idea of archetypes in the occult versus this idea of shadow work and i think that young and or young should be used more in that sense and less in the in the realm of shadow work which i think can actually be really detrimental if done incorrectly or you know without training and to sort of jump off of that so i do a lot more uh, experiential therapy, which is therapy that is done like art therapy, dance therapy, music therapy. And a lot of that, it, it can trace its lineage back to analytical psychology and young. So for example, if you're doing art therapy and the idea is is that it, it gets around the barriers that sometimes arise in talk therapy. So for me, I'm someone who talk therapy, CBT, DBT have never worked because I'm far too analytical. I'm my to use Jung's own words, my consciousness is too strong. And I often am able to analyze why I'm doing something, but I'm not able to change it. So something more experiential like art therapy allows you to tap into the subconscious. However, the way that it's done nowadays is not at all dependent on archetypes. And it's a lot more interesting. For example, they'll be like, I noticed that you drew this person's eyes, but you drew this person with glasses that you can't see them. And then it makes me think, oh, well, maybe I like I'm afraid of this person looking at me. And then I'm able to communicate more directly with myself without my own like analysis getting in the way. So a lot of therapies like that or psychodrama, which is still used today, which is basically like theater therapy, it's a little bit more complicated, but that's the basis. A lot of that is based on Jung and can be really fruitful. I guess you could probably do art therapy like by your, I mean, that's kind of what just like doing art for fun kind of can be sometimes. You're just like, oh, I didn't notice I drew that. That's interesting. Every time I hear shadow work in that terminology, I just get so, <laughs> it just like jabs something in me. Because like I said, the shadow was never meant to be divorced from the work on the ego as well. Like Jung would, would not call it shadow work. Is it individuation? Yes, individuation think, is, is the, the word he used. most specific word he used. So I have a very strong resistance to us using the word shadow work at all because I think it's so divorced from what it actually is and then people look it up and then they fall into like one part of young and not the rest of it so I encourage us to to use a different term in the occult community if you want to if you want to stick with young call it individual individuation or just call it self-reflection or journal prompts like I don't think we like I just because it's not cool like shadow work 
<laughs> as a as a term doesn't mean that it's not useful because reflection is useful that's not what we're i don't want anyone to take away from this episode and say oh they think reflection isn't useful i don't think any of us are saying that i think most of us just want us to analyze and think more critically about young's place in the occult and and therapy as well i'm a big proponent of not divorcing terms from their context mm -hmm. yeah I think we do that a little bit too much, maybe. In, yeah. In our community. Yeah. Yeah. I will say, um, so researching through this episode, I found out loads about things like Taoism, this book called The Golden Flower, which heavily influenced Jung, things about internal alchemy. And I think those are things that you could probably apply to give you a more specific, direct impact on your occult practice than maybe Jung, which has been misappropriated in a psychological way. I don't think there's a problem with it because Jung is obviously very accessible to us because the, um, he's used a lot of myth which is pervasive in Western culture. And if you relate to that, then that's absolutely fine. But um, I just think, look beyond, like he was influenced by a lot of occult authors and maybe it's worth investigating those and not just defaulting to shadow work because it's trendy right now. I do think that like, because Young is such a, it's an amalgamation of like a bunch of different, different practices, kind of all like mushed together in his own belief system, you know, theory, analytical psychology. And really, if you want to... I, I think it would be better if people looked at each of the influences separately and then to see if those, if any of those like specifically worked for their, their worldview or their practice or, you know, whatever, because I think that realistically people would probably get more from one thing individually or maybe one or two things collectively rather than this following Jungian psychology, which is just kind of this like huge grouping of all of these things thrown in and also misconstrued in, in some senses. And so like Kenny, like Kenny said, it might be worth more to go back to the original practices from which he drew some of his ideas and seeing if that fits better with your practice if you have an issue with with the way young presented that information there's also now like there are so many different psych models <laughs> there are there are so many different ways to approaching you know whatever issue you're having for me the idea of like cbt and dbt which are probably the most common methods of you know approaching therapy those don't work for me so things aren't going to work across the board for everyone and I think just like universally recommending young is silly for many reasons um, for many of the reasons we outlined and also just the fact that it's not going to work for everyone and I I'll probably even pop some resources into the episode description there are so many different other theories out there that are done by people who are much more culturally sensitive, <laughs> much less gender and biologically essentialist, don't have like archetypes that rely on the terms primitive and civilized. And there's some that like don't even, there's a lot of psychosomatic therapy techniques out there as well that are much, much more in touch <laughs> with common therapeutic thinkings today as opposed to young. If you want to call it shadow work, go ahead. I'm going to I'm going to be sad. But if you want to do, you know, self-reflection is so important and and seeking out help in whatever ways you can. The therapy section at Barnes & Noble was my lifesaver when I was in college and had had a very bad counselor who was just not helpful. You know, when I couldn't go and get help on my own, I was able to pick up these workbooks and there's tons of workbooks that are, you know, much more guided and and well-founded than Carl G. Young here. Who, whose work wasn't even meant to be a workbook in that, right. that regard. So like, why, why would you ever utilize it like that? Yeah, anyways. So I guess we're, we're getting kind of to our end of the episode mark. Um, does anybody have any, any final thoughts we want to share or personal experiences that we haven't already talked about? We definitely like talked about this episode through for sure. I don't really have anything else, but I did want to mention the um, upcoming workshops in April. If anybody is really interested in using myth or fairy tale, specifically Greek myths, in a kind of archetype psychotherapeutic perspective, there are a couple of work um, workshops I can send a link to. Even though we've thoroughly roasted shadow work, you know, if... <laughs> I'm not going to touch you. <laughs> Maybe you'll learn something and you'll have a rebuttal for what we've just said. So. Yeah, I'll, um, I will pop the link for those workshops in the description. So if you're interested, you can click on them there and check it out if that's something that, that interests you. Yeah, I guess my final thought is 
you know, if you want to read young, read young, leave behind all the nonsense, take what you want. But I think this man no longer needs to be on bookshelves about here is actually helpful therapeutic techniques. I think it's time for him to go and, and be remembered at, for some very interesting ideas, but some ultimately harmful ones as well. So, you know, take young with a grain of salt. And for my own sake, just to make me happy, <laughs> let's find a different term other than shadow work. That's my final thought. <laughs> okay, Phil, we'll call it we'll call it something else to to keep you sane. Well, everyone, that wraps up this episode of Test Tubes and Cauldrons. Thank you for listening. Um, just talk about Carl Jung and kind of kind of roast. <laughs> shadow work and all that it entails if you have other thoughts and other resources that you want to send our way things that came up you know during our discussion as always feel free to let us know you can find me on instagram at um, astrological except logical is spelled like logic and then it's i-a-l because logical was taken already but feel free to send me things in the chat and then i can forward it to the other host and we can talk about it and we might address it later on so feel free to do that but until next time we'll let you go see you next episode have a great day everyone